if this is your first roundtable to be on for us here at Ellerbrock Norris, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, if you'd like to listen or tune in to the prior conversations we've had, uh, reach out to your Ellerbrock Norris team member uh, or the person that invited you to this and ask for a copy of that conversation. We try to record all these uh, to make them accessible. Uh, and so that certainly we can make available to you if you missed out on any of the others. The first roundtable we did, we actually did in person. We, we held meetings uh, both in Hastings, Nebraska and in Omaha. And we discussed that healthcare is made up of a series of supply chain. And that during those meetings, we actually also discussed that <clears throat> the silver bullet to lowering healthcare costs and improving the value of what you get is twofold. In that the solution is you either lower the number of claims that your people consume or the price of those claims. Uh, and, and when I say that out loud, most of you would go, well, yeah, that makes sense. Unfortunately, though, sometimes we don't think that way, do we? Uh, we want our brokers to shop for better insurance rates. Well, guess what? Health insurance is not like any other insurance. It's financing. That's it. Uh, there's no such thing as lower rates unless you have lower claims or uh, a lower price of those claims. So the idea that Blue Cross is going to be better than United, is going to be better than Aetna, is going to be better than Cigna is not a valid one. And if any one of those carriers that I mentioned offers you a uh, stellar rate, you should probably be asking a very important question. Why? Because if you look at their stock prices over the past uh, 10 years, they're up on average over 500% for those publicly traded companies. So uh, they're not willing to take a loss on you, I'm sure. Uh, and so if you're getting better rates from one over the other, I mean, again, there's, there's a margin there that makes sense. But if, there's, if you're getting 10, 15, 20% differential on premiums, uh, something is very, very wrong. And you should probably be asking why. Now, going back to what I said earlier, the real solution is to lower the cost of claims or the number of claims. That's very doable. And it's something that we've addressed in all of our conversations thus far. So the first roundtable discussion we had, we talked about the supply chain in general, the four components, inpatient services, outpatient services, physician services, and prescription drugs. One of your, all of your claims fall into one of those four categories. And if you can understand that and you're in a plan that allows you access to data, then you can manage it because you can manage your supply chain like you manage your business. Um, if you're in a plan that doesn't afford you that ability, you probably want to consider getting into one uh, that does. And there are certainly plans out there now in, uh, that will give you some version of data, even down to as few as five enrolled employees. Um, now, does that mean that that's the right fit for every employer? No, but it's certainly something you should look at. Don't just intentionally stay in whatever model you're in that doesn't give you data and forces you to make decisions blindly when there might be an option available to you to get data and make informed decisions. So that's part one, is understanding your supply chain. And that was the, the, the gist of our first conversation together. Then we talked about doctors, the gatekeepers to that supply chain. And in that, we invited our friends at Strata Health to join us, who do a phenomenal job around direct primary care and talked about the importance of understanding who your gatekeeper is. Because I assure you, the healthcare systems do. The majority of doctors in, in the United States today are now owned by hospital systems. Why? Because that's become their sales force. And so are your employees, the people that are using your money to access the healthcare system, are they utilizing doctors that are working for the hospital systems? Not saying that that's ge in general wrong, it just means that you're probably spending more than you need to. Uh, and so it's important to understand where the doctors are that the majority of your employees are seeing, and then when possible, negotiate better terms with doctors who are gonna have your employees' best interests at heart and not necessarily the hospital systems. The next conversation we had, which would have been the third virtual roundtable, and the one that we had just last time was on the pharmacy industry. And I assure you, if you missed that, you'll wanna get the recording, at least if you wanna be really, really mad. Uh, because we talked about all the things that go on inside of the inner workings of the legal U.S. drug cartel, uh, as we like to refer to it as. Because there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of hands in that proverbial cookie jar. And that is the lowest hanging fruit for every employer to manage their supply chain. Because likely, if you're with any of what we consider to be the BUCAs, Blue, United, Cigna, or Aetna, uh, you're spending money in that component of your supply chain that is unnecessary. We talked during that time about stupid drugs, these drugs that are effectively two generics or over-the-counters that are combined 
with a th multiple thousands of a percentage markup. Duexis, for example, uh, which is ibuprofen and Nexium, or and and uh, uh, Nexium, yeah, uh, that sells for twenty five hundred bucks. That you can buy those two products for eight dollars. Uh, we talked about Vimovo, which is Aleve and Nexium, uh, and that you can get those two products for less than $30 a month, but if you fill it through your plan, you're spending $2,400 a month. So uh, there are currently 62 stupid drugs on the market today that m are covered by most health insurance plans if you let them be. Uh, and so it's important that we always make sure to touch base and understand where our uh, prescription drug supply chain is. That is the easiest to, man to manage. It is the lowest hanging fruit. And as of today, when we look at the statistics of the healthcare supply chain, prescription drugs now has eclipsed all other components uh, besides professional services, which are doctors, uh, so inpatient and outpatient services, as 25% of the total spend of our $3.5 trillion healthcare system. So there's certainly money to be had there. Today, we're going to focus on outpatient services. Now, this is actually the broadest component of the supply chain. It encompasses more detail than any other aspect of the supply chain. A moment ago, I mentioned that prescription drugs now singularly outside of professional services, which are doctors, and that's because those fall into a lot of different categories, whether that's a general practitioner, an anesthesiologist, or radiologist, or proctologist, or all of the ists. Uh, that is professional services, and that is obviously the, the largest, but the, not, the second is outpatient services. Outpatient services now makes up 19% of all healthcare spending. So again, Three and a half trillion dollar spending system, 19% of all spending is now outpatient services. And when I say outpatient, a lot of times we immediately flip to outpatient surgeries. And, and it's understandable as to why, because in the United States today, 70% of all surgeries are now outpatient. And so in thinking about that, it's, it's understandable why we would think when we hear outpatient, we would think outpatient surgery. But there's a lot of other components of that. Things like imaging centers. These are considered outpatient a lot of times. There are inpatient imaging centers, and trust me, you never want to use those. Uh, but outpatient imaging centers uh, are certainly a, th a thing that um, we want to focus on. Uh, physical therapy, also considered outpatient most of the time, as is a lot of other therapeutic, uh, therapeutics or therapy-related um, procedures. Uh, some forms of mental and chemical therapies uh, will be considered outpatient. And there's an important thing we'll talk about there as well. But this is a broad spectrum of the healthcare system. You can have outpatient uh, procedures be very small. For example, an MRI can be as little as $125. <clears throat> uh, an X-ray can be as little as $55 on average. This is I'm using Nebraska numbers here when I mention them. But then you can also have them be very big. An MRI, for example, on the high end in Nebraska can be $6,000. An x-ray can be upwards of $1,500. And so there's a very big differential in those two numbers, MRI for $6,000, MRI for $125. Um, and all of these go back to how your outpatient component of your supply chain is being managed. That's what we want to focus our attention on today. So with that, let's talk about the best place to manage your outpatient patient plan. It's in your plan document. Now, if you're fully insured, a lot of times you don't have control over your plan document. You're effectively renting your health insurance plan from Blue Cross, United, Cigna, or Aetna. And in turn, you're forfeiting your right to really do a whole lot with your plan document. But if you are self-funded, and by the way, I know I've mentioned this before, there are two types of funding mechanisms, fully insured or self-funded. So if you were to say, well, I'm level funded, well, guess what? You're self-funded, okay? I'm partially self-funded. Yep, you're self-funded. So under the classification from the federal government, there are two types of funding, fully insured, state-based managed uh, rental insurance or self-funded. And that has a lot of different components and we'll probably add another virtual roundtable to this to talk about the varying components of healthcare financing. But that can be level funded, it'd be partially self-funded, it'd be fully self-funded. There's a lot of different components of that. It all bases how you file your plan. Do you file it under ERISA as a federally based plan or do you file it in the state of Nebraska as a fully insured plan? 
if you're on any type of funding mechanism outside of a Blue Cross fully insured platform, you are an ERISA-based self-funded plan. So what does that mean? It means at the end of the day, you can control your document, your plan document. Now, part of that is who's your administrator, right? So certain administrators will allow for certain flexibilities. So if you're, let's just, and I'll, I'll use this as an example. If you're with Aetna on their AFA platform, this is their level funded ERISA based self-funded platform for employers who will say are not quite ready to be fully self-funded, but want to at least start to get some access to data. These are fine plans. I have, no, I have no basis to not like these plans outside of the fact of typically if you're in these plans, um, you're spending more than you need to be spending on administrative services. You're getting limited data instead of full access to data. And at the end of the day, they're going to control more of your plan document. Because the greatest way to manage your outpatient expenditures is through the plan document. And under ERISA, as an employer, now this is the interesting part. Whether you're fully insured or self-funded, you as the employer, according to the Department of Labor, are responsible for your plan document. Matter of fact, every employer is required, whether fully insured or self-funded, under ERISA to have what's called an SPD, a Summary Plan document. Most employers who are fully insured do not have one of these. I would encourage you, if that is you, to get one. It's not that you will likely need it, but if you do need it, it's not one of those that you want to determine that you need it and then go try to get it. Because if you're fully insured with Blue Cross, Cigna, United, Aetna, and the Department of Labor shows up on your door and asks for a copy of your summary plan document, and you call Blue Cross, Cigna, United, Aetna and ask them for that, they'll tell you, we do not provide that. That one's on you. The penalty for non-compliance for not having a summary plan document can be as high as $125 per employee per day with no statute of limitations. The DOL can look back as far as they want to. And if you are unable to provide that summary plan document, you can be fined. There was a story that hit the newswire about two years ago of an employer in Texas who had an employee who was, we'll say, flustered. And as such, they hired themselves a really fancy attorney. And that fancy attorney immediately filed suit with the DOL and the employer, and part of their request was for a copy of the summary plan document. The employer, thinking, well, I'm fully insured with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Surely they have that. Contacted Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross says, no, nope, that's not what we do. We will provide you a uh, certificate of coverage which outlines how your deductibles work in co-insurances and co-pays, but we don't provide you with a summary plan document. Probably ought to call your broker. Broker says, hey, I just shop your insurance. It's not my responsibility. In the end, the employer was fined for their 15 employees $90,000 and told by the DOL that they would be back in 60 to 90 days, and they strongly encouraged them that when they came back to have a summary plan document. Summary plan document is an ERISA-based document that effectively tells your employees effectively how you provide benefits, how you don't discriminate, uh, what your allowables are under the plan. This is not deductibles and co-insurances and co-pays. It's just effectively your message to your employees that we're fair and on the up and up. It's in, I would encourage you, if you don't have that document, even if you're fully insured, to get one. You can get them drafted by many attorneys for as little as $1,500. So if you don't have one that can do that for you, contact us here at Ella Brock Norris. We can certainly pass along some of those names to you. I would encourage you to do that. But if you are fully insured, you forfeit your right really to manage your outpatient surgery procedures. But if you're inpatient, or you're, I'm sorry, if you're self-funded, you have the ability then to go create and manage your, outpa your plan document and how it treats certain procedures. So for example, if you go outpatient today, approximately 7.7% .7 in the United States of all procedures that are done outpatient are considered out of network. Many of these are outpatient emergency room procedures and outpatient surgical assistance. So remember I mentioned earlier that 70% of all surgeries are now outpatient, not inpatient. The reason for this is twofold. One is many outpatient surgeons can get more juice out of the squeeze if they have their own agreements with outpatient surgical facilities. In short, 
inpatient hospitals want more of the money. So many surgeons are moving to outpatient facilities. Many are actually collaborating with other outpatient surgeons to open their own outpatient surgical facilities. Many times when they do this, there's one extra squeeze that they can get out of that fruit, and that's what's called a surgical assistant. The vast majority of surgical assistants are not contracted with any network. What that means is big bills, big bills for your members, big bills for you. And so your plan document can protect you on this. It can protect your employees on this, on how out of network procedures are treated. For example, you can utilize a process called reference based pricing, where you utilize a percentage of Medicare to reimburse for these procedures. You can carve in or carve out surgical assistance and you can talk about how you will cover a percentage of their costs. Understand that most of these outpatient facilities, specifically around surgical assistants, are willing to negotiate so long as their surgical assistant gets some bit of the juice from that squeeze. So it's important that this is addressed in your plan document and, and specific. How your plan will treat out-of-network procedures is also important. How your plan will treat other types of procedures is equally as important. And what I mean by that is specifically to behavioral health, mental health, and substance abuse health, many of which those procedures are based on outpatient codes. Outpatient mental, behavioral, and substance abuse is one of the fastest growing areas in our healthcare system and it generates significant profits in large part because the vast majority of them are out of network, specifically the physicians and providers that are part of them. So it's important that your plan document at least plan document specifically addresses these. We recently had a, a story that I came across. Fortunately, it wasn't one of our clients here at Ellibrock, but uh, where a patient was or a plan was built four million dollars for a six week outpatient program for substance abuse. The carrier was Aetna and Aetna approved the billed charges, which means for this employer, their reinsurance premium, their stop loss premium for self-funded plan went up astronomically the following year. The procedure? was daily trips on a yacht off of Malibu's shoreline, two miles off the coast for rest and relaxation, billed out of network through Aetna and approved for payment because the plan document did not address what was reasonable and customary. The healthcare system is smart. These types of layers of the healthcare system are very smart and they do their research and they recognize that many plan documents don't specifically address caps. Now, this is the part where I remind you about a very important part of the Affordable Care Act. You know, the one that said that there's no lifetime maximums. What that means is effectively your plan document has a blank check tied to it. That is unless you put caps on various procedures, which are very much allowed by law. And most of these facilities recognize that if there's a cap, that's what they bill to. So what is your cap? Is it actuarially sound? Have you had it looked at and does it meet all the thresholds of the ACA? I assure you it's important to address that. I'm gonna pause there because I've been talking for a lot and I think I'm hearing some, some noises on the back end. Did anybody have any questions thus far? No, Andrew, I'm looking at it. Go ahead. I'll ask one, Seth, just while everybody's uh, thinking is, you know, we've got a lot of folks in, you know, mid central Nebraska on this call. You know, when you think about outpatient services, um, what are some of the strategies you can use when you may not have either, you know, so many options that in Omaha has or something like that? And also, how do I go about getting that information about outpatient facilities that I should go to? Yeah, that's a great question. So first is, is, is work with whoever your representative is on your plan to try to start to gather that information. So Central Nebraska, for example, uh, from a network discounts perspective, and I, know, I don't know that we talked a lot about discounts. Um, I oftentimes will say that discounts don't matter, prices do. Uh, from the perspective of I'll give you a 99% discount if you'll let me set the starting price. 
Um, and, and insurance companies, by and large, will oftentimes tout their discounts. In central Nebraska specifically, because of the lack of multiple options, we'll call it for outpatient facilities or even inpatient facilities, discounts do matter. Um, they matter more than they might in Omaha, for example. Um, and, and so it's important to understand what network you have and what their discounts look like. What charges are able to be bundled? Uh, and this is where you're going to really want to understand your network. So whether you're using Midlands Choice, whether you're using Aetna, whether you're using Blue Cross. But be careful of Blue Cross because Blue Cross is notorious about saying that they have the greatest discounts. And in some cases, they probably do. Uh, but they also have the most amount of procedures that can be bundled or unbundled. So I, I we'll talk about this more in the inpatient services discussion. Uh, but these are things like where you find the $8 mucus recovery device. It's a tissue. Um, that is unbundled from the room and board charge. Uh, and so it's important to understand that transparency is key. Um, so that's the first place that I would tell you to look. The second thing is, how does your plan document currently treat things like mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse, uh, outpatient uh, emergency room physicians, outpatient procedures that are per, uh, billed under surgical assistant codes? These are important questions to ask. Now, does that mean you need to become an expert on them? No, by no means. But you need to make sure an expert is looking at it for you uh, and that that's being managed appropriately. Those are some of the key areas that I would encourage you to look at. Yeah, and I'd love to hear any follow-ups from the group of what anybody's experienced around that, if you have any follow-ups on that. But um, otherwise, any other questions from anybody right now? So to that end, let's talk about how we might structure our plan document. It's important to re recognize that your plan document is a living and breathing document. In other words, this isn't Ronco. It's not set it and forget it. It is a process by which you need to be managing it based on your employee population and what their needs are. For example, oftentimes we'll look at plan documents and they have limitations on things like physical therapy uh, or outpatient therapies. Understandably why, why a plan document would do that, however, it's important that you also have um, verbiage in your plan document that says, unless deemed medically necessary, um, or an, unless additional services are deemed medically necessary. And, and here's why. There are a number of uh, health conditions that require uh, multiple physical therapy uh, or even speech pathology or some of these other procedures to, um, to encourage continuous growth and improvement of health. Um, and, and, and so a lot of the musculoskeletal degenerative diseases, uh, things like that, um, some of your autism diseases, um, these types of things oftentimes will require more than most plans have built into their therapy visits. I want to be careful that we not um, set up our plan and think that we're saving the tree but burning down the forest in the process. And what I mean by that is that if you have a... Um, a musculoskeletal disease where you have a degenerative musculoskeletal disease and that physical therapy is a good way to manage that, but that therapy might require 30 visits or even uh, 50 visits a year. It's, not, it's important that you have the flexibility within your plan document to extend those visits upon medical necessity because the surgeries that are going to be required on the back end to repair the damage that could be lost as a result of the therapy that's being done could far outweigh the average cost of those physical therapy visits. And so that's why it's important not to just look at a plan document, set your thresholds and move on. You need to understand what, what's going on. You need to understand how these outpatient services are negotiated, at what basis of either discount, reference of Medicare, uh, flat rate charge, single case agreements, all those things are done. Which leads me to my, uh, well, we'll call maybe our final point before we open it up to the discussions is recognize that outpatient is arguably the most negotiable component of the healthcare supply chain. Oftentimes we refer to it as the Priceline.com methodology. Remember I said a moment ago that outpatient surgeries, there's roughly 70% of them are now done on an outpatient basis. That's tens of thousands upon thousands of surgeries a year. Now, if you've ever used Hotels.com, Priceline.com, Expedian, or goodness, any of these other shop for services, the reason that they can get you better deals on hotels and flights is because they recognize, as 
to the hotel companies and the airline that empty seats and empty beds make no money. And so oftentimes these travel sites will reach out to hotels and they'll form agreements. And they'll reach out to airlines and they'll form agreements that if you have empty seats that you are unable to sell, give them to us, we will go sell them for you. But you have to be willing to give those up at sometimes a 40, 50, even as high as 70% discount. Guess what? Healthcare works the same way. Surgeons that aren't cutting make no money. So before we get all eager about our in-network Blue Cross discount on that knee scope that's going to allow us to get that knee scope after discounts for $26,000, let us be aware that in Nebraska, throughout Nebraska, there are negotiated single case agreement contracts for that same knee scope with the top surgeons for as little as $12,000. You can get those procedures oftentimes more than half off if you're willing to negotiate and if you're willing to work with them on single case arrangements. You wanna make sure that your plan document allows for that because if you're renting your plan document from Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, or you're just adopting a plan document that they've given you in your self-funded plan, it probably doesn't allow for that. And you'll wanna take advantage of it. And oftentimes you'll hear us talk about the ability to improve the value of benefits while simultaneously lowering cost. Right there is the perfect example. Because if I go to your employee and I'm able to get them to utilize the surgeon who has the top rating uh, for quality metrics at $12,000 just so long as they have the surgery on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, and I can cut that surgery from $26,000 to $12,000, it's probably worth it for you to waive their $3,000 deductible, isn't it? So they win, you win because you spent $12,000 on the surgery versus $26,000. The surgeon wins, everybody wins, except for maybe Blue Cross United Signa or Aetna. But that's okay. We don't care all that much about them anyway. Right. So that's the moral of the story here is outpatient procedures give you massive flexibility for single case agreements. Many of you may have seen a video that I put out recently. If, if Ellerbrock, uh, your Ellerbrock team member sent it to you, where I talk about I had to go get an outpatient chest scan recently. Uh, and, and part of that chest X-ray, I contacted the, the outpatient provider beforehand. And of course, the first question they ask is, who's your insurance? And I said, well, before I, we talk about that, what is your cash pay price? Guess what? The cash pay price for the outpatient chest x-ray was $55. So I go in to get my chest x-ray. I hand them my ID card. They see the Aetna logo on it. And I go in, go to the back to get my chest x-ray. I come back out, and they tell me it's going to be $127. Bucks. Now, I said, well, wait a minute. I called in earlier and asked for the cash price, and they said, and you told me it was going to be $55. And they said, absolutely, it is $55 if you pay cash. But if you run it through that card, at our agreement with Aetna is $127. That happens each and every day. Cash is still king, especially when it comes to health care. So you want to make sure that your plan document does two things. One, it rewards employees for being good consumers and paying $55 instead of $127. Maybe give them deductible credit on that, right? So these are the things that you're going to want to do in your plan document to encourage better consumerism. Encouraging better consumerism means better consumers. Better consumers means lower claims. Lower claims means lower premiums. It's all part of that supply chain management. And when you can get to the point where your employees become your best supply chain managers, you will win. You can improve the quality of your benefits while simultaneously reducing your costs. It is that unicorn we oftentimes talk about, but don't feel like we can ever find. It is out there, but you have to manage it better. All right. With that, Elliot, I will turn it back over to you for questions and comments and uh, bad jokes. <laughs> Hopefully we don't have any bad jokes. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I would love to open it up to anybody that does have a question. There's the chat function there. Um, I had sent out a message to everybody earlier, just letting you know where it was at, or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. But, uh, but yeah, I thought that's great. A lot of information, Seth. So, uh, while anybody's thinking of questions, feel free to reach out to me or Seth or any of our team members who there's several on the call today. Um, you know, for more information of, of any piece of this as well after if, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question now, but <clears throat> there was a lot of a lot of info in there. So um, 
we'll kind of leave it open maybe for, for a little bit here um, for any questions that, that might come up. Otherwise, um, I don't see any in the chat box. Andrew, are you seeing anything? Or I guess you can look over at Andrew, Seth, and see. <laughs> I'm going to add one thing, though, and, and this is something that's probably very important as you communicate and educate your employees specific to outpatient services, but this can actually fall into inpatient services, too, so this is important. Recognize that there's no such thing as a balanced bill that's not negotiable, all right? So a lot of times we're seeing procedures that fall into, um, even in some cases, depending on the plan, we, we will consider uh, transport as outpatient. <laughs> I know that sounds weird to think about ground transport or air transport as outpatient, but it really can be, and it is kind of in that classification. It's that one weird area of the healthcare system where nobody really knows where to put it. It's not a prescription drug. It's not a provider service. It's not inpatient. So everything else kind of flows to that outpatient corridor. Um, air transport specifically, uh, is intentionally billed at a very high rate for two reasons. Um, and this isn't to demonize uh, some of those. I know there's a lot of organizations on the air transport side that are nonprofit and try to do good work. Um, and they've been squeezed out in large part by big insurance companies. But most of the time, those are out of network. Uh, the networks do not negotiate with air transport, and they're not willing to, and they don't want to. So the idea behind how air transport, and even in some cases ground transport, is we see more and more municipalities uh, look to privatize uh, their ground transport. So you need to know your community. Are you using a municipal-based ambulance system or is it a privatized-based ambulance system? If it is privatized, there's a better than not chance it's out of network. If it's municipal, it's probably in network. These are important things to know and understand because recognize specifically if you're self-funded but even if you're fully insured that these organizations have two goals in mind first get as much as they can out of the insurance company and then second sell the rest of it off to debt collectors that's the goal so it's important to know that because what we don't want to have happen is your employees credit get really messed up in the process of that when very easily you can get the same deal the debt collectors would have gotten. So recently we had um, a case come across our desk of a member who had a 10 mile flight from their motorcycle accident to the local hospital, 10 miles, $85,000 was, I'm sorry, I apologize. It was $127,000, 85,000 was the balance bill after the fact. So effectively Blue Cross paid their portion of the $127,000 bill, which left the member with $85,000 worth of bills. Now, this particular member stressed over this, fretted over it for months, for months worried about what this was going to do to their family, for months worried about what it might happen as a result of their inability to pay the claim. And for months got nowhere. They filed an appeal, Blue Cross denied the appeal. They paid, they, they claimed that they paid the maximum they were going to pay per the contract and effectively told the uh, air ambulance to go pound sand, leaving the member holding the bag. The member finally reached out to us and told us what was going on. In 10 minutes on the phone with the air ambulance company, the bill went from $85,000 to $3,000. And of that 10 minutes, probably seven minutes were niceties. How are you? How's your day going? What's going on today? How's the weather, right? These companies are willing to negotiate. Recognize that is the differential between what they would have sold that debt off to a debt collector, okay? So if you know how the game is played, you can play it. And like I said, oftentimes we're busy playing a game of checkers while the healthcare system's playing a really good game of chess, all right? You don't wanna be lost uh, where everybody else moving five moves, thinking five moves ahead, and you're just thinking about how to jump the next piece. All right, and, and that's the moral of the story here, and that's, that's just air ambulance, right? Um, again, that's what they were going to sell the, the, the amount to the debt collector. So a few minutes on the phone with them and letting them know that we understand how the game is played, you're going to sell this off to a debt collector. What is the amount you'll take for my client? $3,000. Done. Thanks very much. Have a great day, right? It's an $82,000 swing on a medical bill, $82,000, $85,000 actually, it won't ever hit their negative credit score just because we took the time to have a conversation. Most people are too intimidated by that conversation. They shouldn't be, especially if there's help for them, all right? And so that's an important moral of this. Outpatient procedures 
whether they are surgical, whether they are outpatient um, uh, surgical assistants, whether they are grand, uh, ground or air transportation, whether they are emergency room physicians, um, which are largely now not in network, um, all of these procedures will likely have attached to them balanced bills. They're all negotiable. It's important that we do that. Absolutely. And Seth, that, that reminded me of one that I think is applicable here that we like to talk about, which not just to outpatient services, but um, I think it would be important to, to talk through the importance of bill review as well in our $250,000 knee scope that we've seen and, and maybe just that piece of it. I know that that doesn't just apply to outpatient services, but it can, and I think it's important, you know. Yeah, and we may have talked about this in some of our roundtables before, but um, there's a process in the healthcare world today called auto adjudication contracts. Uh, and this is the great way in which insurance companies uh, negotiate with healthcare providers. Um, and part of that is, and by the way, this is not to demonize every hospital system. There's some phenomenal hospital systems that don't operate this way. Um, most of them are not CHI. Did I say that out loud? I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have. Um, most of them are not big conglomerates. <laughs> I'll get I'll get I'll get slapped later. Um, but the reality is, is that they, they don't operate in these capacities, um, but some of them do. Uh, and part of that is what is called auto adjudication arrangements. And this is where during the conversations around negotiating their in network contracted rate, hospital systems and surgical facilities uh, will negotiate what are called auto adjudication rates. In short, that's the number of claims that can be submitted that won't be looked at by a human. Guess which claims have errors on them? The one that no human's going to look at, <laughs> right? So Elliot's referring to, we, uh, this was an, a couple of years ago, we had a claim that came across our desk for $250,000. It was for a knee procedure, knee scope procedure. Um, now I've seen a lot of these in my 20 years in the business and I've seen some big ones and I've seen complications as a result of them that generate higher claims. I've never seen one for $250,000. Now, I won't mention the name of the insurance company that approved it for payment, Cigna, but I will say that, um, you know, we obviously, our spidey senses went up. And so we started looking at it. We immediately contacted, the, our team did, I, you know, it contacted the uh, provider, the hospital or the surgical facility. And it took them no less than probably 15 minutes to call us back and say, oh, we found the error. We put the decimal point in the wrong spot. It's supposed to be $25,000. Because our question was, did the patient code on the table? Like, what happened? Uh, nope. Perfectly routine. Just a decimal point error. Now, our second call was to our friends that said insurance company, which shall remain nameless, to say, why in the world did you approve this for payment? To which their response was, we had to. It fell under our auto adjudication arrangement. Which leads me to the moral of the story. Nobody is going to manage your money better than you. You need to manage it. I assure you the insurance companies are not interested in doing that. Remember, they make more money the more claims you pay, not the fewer claims you pay. So it's important that you are mining your store, mining your supply chain, or at least you're, you've got somebody doing that for you. So it's important that you look at bills, that your employees look at their bills. Um, there was a report that came out uh, a couple of years ago from Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services that talked about how many, which were the majority, of bills have inaccuracies on them, and they're never caught. And that's in large part because most of the time you don't get a full bill. You get what's called a summary. And even if you did get the full bill, you'd have no clue how to read the darn thing. And that's intended. So it's important to look at those things because they have errors. My, me personally, I tell the story oftentimes of I had to have surgery a few years ago. Outpatient, by the way. Uh, and there were a number of charges, including surgical assistance, uh, that were on it. And these are things that we had discussed going into it. So I knew going into this surgery, which was a $52,000 surgery, exactly what the cost would be because I'm that guy. <laughs> and um, in other words, my wife hates going to the doctor with me or going through anything with me when it comes to medical stuff. Uh, but, you know, we'd done our research. So when I looked at the bill and I looked at my deductible, and I looked at all the components, I realized that they were 
effectively double charging me for a number of the procedures. It literally took me taking those bills down to the facility to sit down with the billing clerk, to look at them together, to say, wait a minute, you've already billed for this, so why is it billed again here? To realize that it was a dual coded bill. That means that 1% part of the bill, for example, the surgical assistant was billed twice. The anesthesiology, billed twice. There were a number of things on the bill that were billed twice. And sadly, because of auto adjudication, the insurance company never caught that. I did. So this is a very important thing. And we talk about it. Remember, we, I said at the very beginning, there's two ways to lower the cost of health care. You reduce the number of claims and the price of the claims. We spent the vast majority of our time today talking about the price of claims. The number of claims, pretty easy too, just to remove the waste, the misuse. 25% of all billed health care is either unnecessary or inaccurate. Think about that. Think about your annual spend on your health care. Multiply that number by 25%. That's what you just burned or threw away or however you want to say it last year if you weren't looking at your bills. Yep. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. We did get one more question as you were um, talking there from Kevin, appreciated it, is what are the best practice methods to get your employees actively involved in reviewing bills, shopping providers, et cetera, et cetera, being a good consumer? Yep, incentivize them. The wallet, right? So a lot of times we'll see employers create incentive programs for, hey, if you find an error on your bill, we'll give you, and, and we can correct it, uh, we'll give you a percentage of the savings and a bonus. Uh, it's taxable, obviously, you got to follow tax guidelines, but that's one way of doing it. Uh, we'll apply that towards your deductible. We'll reduce your deductible if you use these outpatient single case agreement uh, programs. So if there's a program out there that's going to allow you to get a NISCO for $12,000 versus $25,000, waive their deductible to use it, right? Incentive-based programs, you have to encourage them in the wallet. That's what's going to get their attention. It's going to take time. Understand that you can't just tell them once at an open enrollment meeting either. You got to constantly be reinforcing that we're in this together. This is how you be a better consumer. By the way, and I've said this before on these calls I know I have or these roundtables, consumer-driven health care, i.e. HSA plans, are period the worst period thing, period ever, period to have in health care. They are. And I say that as somebody that's been enrolled in an HSA plan for 15 years. Um, but I am enrolled in one for a vast different reason than the vast majority of employees. Most employees enroll in them because it's the cheapest thing you've offered them, which means that there is a massive barrier to them getting the health care that they should be getting. 90% of all costs in our health care system today, our $3.5 trillion system, is generated by 10% of our population. That 10%, a big chunk of them, I'm guessing, there's no data to back this up, but I'm guessing are on consumer-driven health plans because they don't go get that MRI when they need it. They don't go get that physical therapy when they need it because they have a $3,000 deductible barrier to entry. We must bring the milk to the front of the grocery store. I'm all but positive I've used that metaphor before, right? Where's the milk in the grocery store? Far back corner. Why? Ain't no profit in milk. So the grocery store wants you to walk through the entire place, all the double stuff Oreo cookies, and pay that margin before you can get to that milk. Healthcare needs to be treated differently than it's treated today because today that deductible serves to put access to the far back corner because that generates more profit for the system. You should find a way to let your plan pay for MRIs for free. The caveat is you gotta go to the place that's 125 bucks. You don't go there, the deductible applies, right? That outpatient surgery, absolutely free to you, no deductible, so long as you go to the place that we've did we are able to negotiate a single case agreement for a fraction of the cost. All of those components create incentives to your employees. Barring that, allow your employee the ability to prove to you that they're being a consumer. And if they do, create an incentive. I don't care if it's a coffee gift card. Do something to say thank you to them for being a good consumer. Absolutely, and thanks for that, Kev or that question, Kevin. Um, my problem is, Seth, usually the milk goes hand in hand with the double stuff Oreos, and I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. you know. We're going to have one of these on wellness programs, which, by the way, my COVID <laughs> wellness thing is completely out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we appreciate uh, everybody's time. I know we're coming up here on about 50 minutes, so uh, if there are any more questions, please send them in quick, and we will certainly um, get them answered. But uh, appreciate your time, Seth, and uh, Always everybody's time for sitting in absolutely we'll uh 
We're getting into fourth quarter here. We know everybody's going to be, or not everybody, but a lot of people will be coming up on open enrollments and renewal times around their health care. So we'll continue to try to get as much education out as we can um, so that you are well prepared going into those discussions and, and renewal period and how you can make a difference on your health care plan. 